Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. This week, we'll talk with my friends and colleagues at Stansberry Research, David Doc Eifrig and Tom Carroll. They have a brand new research product that I really want to learn more about, and I'm sure you'll want to learn more about it too. In the mailbag this week, gold, gold, and more gold. Mostly people who are disappointed in its performance. And remember, you can call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. And for my opening rant this week, I'll talk about the definition of a recession, that and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Well, why talk about the definition of a recession at all, right? Well, it's because it was in the news last week, wasn't it? it we, we saw um, numerous people from our government, Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, President Biden uh, made reference to it, and folks like um, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo and, and another guy whose name escapes me right now. I should have it in front of me, shouldn't I? Um, but, you know, some economic advisor or another. And the, and the message is they're all trying to sort of gaslight you and say, well, you know, two quarters of declining GDP, that's not necessarily the definition of a recession. That's the, We're not in a recession just because we've just had two quarters of declining real GDP. And I think this is, um, they're gaslighting you. They're playing games. It's pure propaganda. Simple definitions are much more valuable than long, complex ones. The White House put out a blog post where they had one little paragraph at the start to say, you know, there's this definition of, of a recession as two declining quarters of real GDP. And then they did like four or five paragraphs out of the next six or seven or whatever. Like most of this blog post was this complicated attempt to describe how they establish whether or not it's a recession, how the, the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, establishes a recession. And it's a bunch of complicated gobbledygook. We're in a recession. Now, you can debate whether or not it's important to know that because it's a backward looking indicator. Right. We've just seen two declining quarters of GDP. We're in the next quarter now that we've just learned this. So you can debate how useful it is, but you can see what the government is doing. Right. They're trying to tell you that everything's OK. And, and Joe Biden keeps saying, no, this is part of the transformation to more steady growth or whatever. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's Orwellian, in fact, right? Love is hate. War is peace, right? When in 1984, George Orwell's book, that's what the government said. Love is hate. War is peace. Everything was backwards. All the definitions were changed so that they could take control of, of your very mind, of the words that you use, the thoughts that you think. And, and that's all this is, and it's ridiculous. Simple definitions are far superior. You know, we, we need rules of thumb. We can't function with all this complicated gobbledygook. And there's nothing wrong with being in a recession, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's not pleasant, but you have to say it when it occurs. So there is that. So, and the investment implications are, whoa, gee, if we're, wh wh are we still going to be in a recession this quarter? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But just compare it to your experience and to the experience of people you know. You know, um, they tried to gaslight us about inflation too. Oh, it's transitory. It's not that bad. Blah blah blah. And here it is, nine percent, and it's, and they're saying, oh, it's not transitory, <laughs> right? So. Um, same thing. When you think about that, you think, well, inflation, what do I want to do? You know, do I want to do what Dan says and hold gold? Do I want, you know, do I want Bitcoin? Do I want real estate? Do I want, um, you know, sort of old economy kind of industrial stocks? What do I want to do about this? And it's the same thing with recession, which is often viewed as the opposite of inflation. I think that's probably a mistake 
it's often true, but it's not always true. You can have, you know, what people refer to as stagflation, stagnant or negative real growth um, with lots of inflation. I mean, inflation is the thing that makes real growth negative, right? It would have been positive GDP growth if not for inflation, right? So, so these things can exist simultaneously and you need to know that they're there. And when, when you turn on your TV and the government is trying to gaslight you into believing that the things you're seeing in front of you, like paying 30% more for food and rent and everything you buy, um, you know, it, it, it can make you a little crazy, but you're not crazy. There is inflation. We have, we did just print 9% CPI um, inflation and, and we did just print negative 0.9% real GDP growth. So you're, you're saying <laughs> the government's crazy. It's real. And then, of course, what you do about it. We've discussed, you know, um, what, what to do about these things. Um, basically, I've been telling people for a couple of years now, just hold plenty of cash. Make sure you hold the stocks of really great businesses, especially the ones that earn nice high returns on capital, right? Because if a business is earning, you know, 5% on capital, 5% on equity, however you want to define it. Um, and inflation is 9%. Well, that's negative 4% for every dollar invested at that level. So that's not good. But if a business is a really great thing, if it's a software company or something, and it's earning 50% returns on capital, and inflation is 10%, hey, 40% on capital is awesome. And it's probably, you know, gushing free cash flow too, if it's a good software company. So um, you do want to own really great businesses um, that can that can keep earning returns through through a recession or through inflation. And you want to own, I think you do want to own gold and silver. I'll talk more about it in the mailbag. And whether or not you want to own Bitcoin, I'm not even going to talk about it anymore. I told you I sold mine. It it trades like a speculative asset. And I'm not buying it back until I see some sign that it's that it really can protect you from that it that it can act like a store of value or an inflation hedge or a currency. Right now, I can't do any of that because it trades like a biotech stock or a you know a penny mining stock fraud or something. It's it's just it's a little too crazy to to be taken seriously. Um, I think I'm going to leave you right there. We are in inflation. We are in re recession. Yes, they can happen together. No, don't listen to the government gaslighting you about them. Hold plenty of cash, gold and silver, great businesses. Not much has changed. <laughs> Despite the government's attempts to convince you otherwise, not much has changed. All right. Let's now talk, not with one guest, but with two great guests, Doc Eifrig and Tom Carroll. Let's do it right now. Look, I think you know by now, I'm always trying to tell you the really hard truths, even when, especially when, what I have to say is unpopular. Today, the hard truth is that your wealth is in danger. Everything you may have made in the bull market of the last decade could disappear very quickly. Some of it's probably gone already. This process has already started, and even if the financial markets somehow avoid a devastating crash from here, inflation is still eating 8% of your money every year. I've spent 20 years helping people prepare for extreme market shifts, just like the one we're going through right now in my role at Stansberry Research. I've recommended 24 triple-digit winners, and I called the collapse of Lehman Brothers with near-perfect timing. Well, today I'm issuing my biggest warning ever. If you want to preserve your retirement and your lifestyle in the coming years, you need to act. I recently went on camera to lay out a simple one-step plan for what to do. You can set yourself up in minutes and likely forget about inflation, rising prices, or the worst effects of a market crash for years to come. This plan does not involve options, shorting, crypto, or anything complicated, and it doesn't require perfect timing. 
the perfect time to act is right now. And you could see triple digit upside in the coming years. To watch my full interview with the brilliant financial journalist and hard asset expert, Daniela Cambone, simply go to www.crashprotection2022.com. Again, that's www.crashprotection2022.com to watch our full interview for free. Time for our interview. Today we have two guests, David Doc Eifrig and Tom Carroll, my uh, friends and colleagues here at Stansbury Research. Doc is an MBA, former Wall Street trader, published author, and medical doctor. He even owns a winery, you know, to fill his copious amounts of free time. In the Stansbury Research Universe, he's the editor of Retirement Millionaire, Retirement Trader, Income Intelligence, Advanced Options, and the Health and Wealth Bulletin. Tom Carroll was once named by Fortune Magazine as the number one healthcare analyst in the U.S. His research has been referenced by healthcare publications and institutional investors alike, along with CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fox Business. And Stansberry readers know him for his investment expertise in the emerging legal cannabis market. Doc and Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Dan. Thanks for for having me. It's been a a while since I've been on. Um, I hope that's not because I I did something bad the last time. So thanks for (laughs) having me. Not at all. Yeah, same here. Appreciate it. That's, I think it's probably been a year or so since I've been on as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. A lot has happened. It's so good to be here. And um, I want to focus primarily on the project that you guys are doing together, the, the Prosperity Investor, the new research product that you've got coming out. And the first thing on my mind is like, what took you two so long to get together? Like, Tom, what have you been here, a decade already or something? I mean, <laughs> what took you two so long to get together and do this? <laughs> well, I mean, I can speak immediately to it because, um, you know, my one initial project, Retirement Millionaire, um, was sort of a, a teeny tiny version of this. That is, it was meant to be Doc with his background on Wall Street, uh, biotech, medicine. He can speak to folks um, but, you know, kind of more of a general and I would say a mix of personal finance and little health tips here and there in the back half of our letter. And nobody ever wanted to do this bigger thing, which would be really hard to do alone. And um, in the newsletter business and advisory business, it's kind of been thought unless you're selling pills and potions that cure diabetes and erectile dysfunction and all this nonsense, you know, something like what we're doing wouldn't work. And of course, with this launch we've seen so far in the last week, it's been incredible, the reception from subscribers and new folks. So we're, so we're super excited. And I know, I mean, Tom can add to this, but I, when we brought Tom over and, and folks, Tom Carroll is um, probably the sharpest guy I know in the healthcare space. Um, he has a master's in healthcare finance from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. 17 years as an analyst and managing director for a Wall Street firm called Leg Mason, uh, Stiefel Financial. I mean, those that, that group almost has a, a trillion dollars of assets under management. He's won Wall Street Journal's Best on the Street Award twice, Fortune's All-Star Analyst, so on and so forth. You know, I remember meeting you, Tom, and sitting there in that room and being so excited. And I think um, I probably got you too excited then. And you thought this would have happened <laughs> a long time ago. Because I know as, as this is the success is more and more, I hear all these people going, oh, I knew this. I mean, like, no, no, Tom, no one, no one. <laughs> Until we did this, everyone was saying it couldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. So, you know, and then then to add... John Engel, and John comes at it from sort of the bench on up. He has a master's in science from Johns Hopkins, has worked at biotech startups and pharmaceutical companies. He's an expert in fermentation kinetics, and folks know about my winery business. That's something that I'm super excited to pick his brain on that area as well. Not that we're going to do that in this product, but anyway, these two guys and myself, it was like, all right, the time is right. 
Uh, we're all aging. The baby boomers are coming on into the last couple decades of their lives. What can we do? How can we invest? How can we help people increase their health span? All this. I'm, I'm babbling too long, but Tom, what, what's your take on this? Why did it take us so long? Yeah. Well, Doc, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. I, I really appreciate it. You know, healthcare has been my career passion uh, since, actually, since I was in high school, if you believe that. You know, I grew up in a healthcare family. Uh, so, so talked about it at the dinner table wow. almost every night. Love it. But uh, yeah, the, the, I, I guess I can't directly speak to the, to the delay right here at, at Stansbury Research, other than you know, along the way. And, and Dan, I haven't been here 10 years. I've, you know, I've been here three years, although it feels really? quicker wow. than that. Um, uh, yeah, it's a little over three years now. But, you know, these things take time to percolate within our business. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about ideas and mulling them over and, you know, pitching. And every time I would pitch this to, to the powers that be, you know, I'd go back and I'd, I'd, I'd sit and look at my presentation from the prior time and look at it, look it over and maybe tweak it here, tweak it there, update it for market conditions and, you know, and, and go, go back to the group and, and talk about it again. And, and I think the market that we have today um, it, that, that likely started like six months ago is just perfect for this kind of product, just given the defensibility of healthcare and how, if we look back over time uh, through recessions and, and market drawdowns, Healthcare tends to either stay flat or, or or go up a little bit, and I think that you know healthcare is such a complex and some people think it's boring sector to invest in. I think it's paramount for every investor or or, or anyone who you know takes a, a self directed or a primary interest in how they're investing their money. You have to know and have some exposure to healthcare. I mean, it's a four trillion dollar market that is only getting bigger and goes up each and every year. And I think because of that, it, it makes it just right. Yeah, for well, investment. certainly boring is probably a lot more exciting to a lot of people right now after, you know, seven, seven to nine mm -hmm. months of this. So, okay. That brings us to this moment. You guys are getting together. You've created this new research product, which I noticed that the word healthcare is not in the name of the product. It's just called the prosperity investor. I mean, you know, what's in a name? I don't even know if you think it's worth talking about, but I just found that very curious. Tom, you, Doc, you can handle that question. Okay, all right, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we were uh, thinking about that, we wanted to capture, I mean, one of the names that was on the table that was close was going to be called St Stansbury Thrive. And it was close to being the winning name, but when it, we thought about it, uh, we wanted to remind people that it wasn't just about thriving. It was about prosperity and wealth and investing in prosperity. And prosperity for me, for us, encompassed both your wallet, but also your health. And so one of the stools of the really three legs in this product is helping people get a handle on and understanding what else there is, what's happening when we see it happening, testing things, responding, reporting back to our subscribers about what stuff we see. I've been wearing now uh, an aura ring, doing sleep apps at night, uh, a whoop watch. I've, I've tried the Google watch, I've, I've Fitbit, you name it, to kind of give people an idea of, okay, well, if you're a person that likes to you know, follow your sleep and your heart rate variability and your oxygenation and, and you're working out once a day, uh, you know, this is the product for you. So the prosperity part of it relates to this idea that health span will be increasing within our lifespan. And, you know, a 60 year old is expected to live now till like 82. And so we want to make sure both through investing in healthcare and it's happening right now. I mean, there are people and products and things in both in the tech space um, everything just from how you're consuming medications, receiving them, reminders. Uh, we've seen telehealth come up. But, but the idea of prosperity, Dan, is really related to both making money in these investments as well as learning how to maximize your span of you being healthy. And that's 
to me, the most exciting place to be because I'm older. I'm, I'm very tail end of the baby boomer group. And you can see it. You know it. You know, even though I'm a three-time marathoner, I, you know, I ache after running a, a slow 5K. Well, what things can you do to reduce and, and minimize aches and pains? That, that will be discussed in this product. But more importantly, there are, you know, drugs, there are systems in place. There are, we, I mean, gosh, we've got a list of portfolio of seven stocks we think you can buy and hold that will manage a portfolio and help and our hedge, a hedge against inflation, a hedge against downturns. Uh, we back all this stuff up in our, in our stories that we uh, have shared to folks, but it's just, to me, it's so, such an obvious place to be. Tom has been doing it, like he said, since he was in high school. Um, I've been thinking about how you integrate everything into one thing. So, uh, you know, some folks have called it the healthcare singularity. Myself being a physician, a medical researcher, MBA, all this, I, I just, it's time and the time is right. And so, prosperity is just a way of trying to. Okay gather all that together into one word. And hopefully people will, when they hear that, will remind them of, you know, not only do you need to buy the stock, but you need to go out for a five mile walk. Got it. So, and with prosperity, of course, comes greater wealth all around and greater investment in healthcare technology. And it's kind of, it does, when you start talking about it the way you do it, I agree. It's kind of an obvious thing place where everybody ought to have some capital. So let's talk about then what is great. There has to be like, I can't believe between the two of you there. Uh, if I just say there has to be what a handful, three, four, five huge trends right now that are directing large flows of cat where large flows of capital are moving into them. And, um, you know, they have really great potential for investors. Am, am I correct? Uh, you, you got a handful of these for me? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have anything at the tip of your tongue? If, if uh... I think that the tip of the tongue answer is, is some of the obvious stuff like, um, you know, telemedicine and telehealth and the pandemic just, you know, accelerated a lot of technology that was already, you know, in existence at the time, two, three years ago. Uh, but the pandemic and, uh, confining all of us to our homes, you know, really, really laid bare the need for this type of technology uh, during the last couple of years. And I, I put that into a, a larger bucket of what I call digital healthcare, right, which is basically you, leveraging technology uh, to improve upon, make more efficient, create better outcomes of therapies and interventions that already exist. Uh, you know, so that, you know, this, the invention of the smartphone has and this little, you know, fantastic computer we can carry in our pockets has done so much, uh, basically, uh, in, in the realm of healthcare uh, that makes it more convenient for us uh, and uh, much more efficient in a lot of cases for the physician. Uh, you know, if we're talking about something that, you know, we don't need to be two feet away from the person to, to diagnose or have an intervention on. And I would point out, I, I started seeing this trend about 10 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, for whatever reason, right? Maybe it was, you know, technology had gotten to a point where, uh, you know, it was, it, it was, it was easier to, to create these software solutions, you know, at the same time that the Affordable Care Act was written into law. Uh, and, and I think that, I think that big times in healthcare, like the Affordable Care Act happening or the pandemic, they're, they're record scratch moments, right, in healthcare. Um, and if, if you're as old as me and Doc, you can remember what a record scratch sounds like right. <laughs> when you bump the needle. Um, it's jarring, right? And, and so that's really when I started seeing all these companies come out of the woodwork. And I was actually so excited myself. And a lot of these came to me through my connections at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. Uh, at Hopkins, uh, that I start, I started putting my own money to work, investing in startup, innovative healthcare companies that were linking technology to some kind of intervention that's been happening forever, uh, and um, it, 
it's only accelerated. I mean, it, the data, some of the some of the investment dollars I've seen, I have this chart I'm, I'm thinking about now, that uh, uh, you know from from 2012 to 2022, something like 90 billion dollars has gone into these small innovative companies, many of which that were on the earlier part of that time frame are now, you know, coming out with Series B, Series C, you know, IPO funding rounds and being much more available to to the average investor out there. Um, and the other thing to note about that 90 billion, uh, about half of it came just in the last three years. Right. So going back to my comment about, you know, record scratch moments in healthcare, the pandemic in this case just absolutely explodes investment into healthcare. Um, you know, and I, I like to say our health is our number one asset, right? That has to be managed like anything else. And as a result, if you're going to manage your health, you got to understand the system, the players, uh, the, the, the rules of the game. And the better that you do that, the better you will make your life and the quality of your life. Yeah, and I can, and that at the same time, you you know, you got this four, what just one more, you got this four trillion dollar industry that, you know, I think you could spend your entire investment career in altogether, and and outperform broader markets. Yeah, and I to your question, Dan, I mean, a couple of things I'll see. I'll, I can touch on the financial what's happening, and I can touch on a couple really exciting science things just in the last forty eight hours that I've come across. VC investing in healthcare hit a record $28 billion in 2019. A year later, it went from $28 billion to $44 billion. And then in the next year, it went to $80 billion. All right? This is exploding. And when you actually look at some of the large pharmas, there's a handful of them, large pharma, large drug makers have enough cash on hand to buy all of small and mid-cap biotech today. Now, it doesn't mean they're all going to get bought out, but it means as that tech proves itself and shows practical proof and gets approved, this stuff is going to be worth billions of dollars. And an example of this is, um, you know, when you come, let's say you've got cancer, and your immune system is a little bit altered, and you come in with a fever, you're a little bit delirious, the doctor wants to know what to do, and most cases, the cancer doc immediately puts you on broad-spectrum antibiotics, antifungals, and things that, um, let's just say you, you don't want to have that happen to you more than three times because your body just can't take getting hit with that much drug and chemical. And so you, what you have to do is you get, you take, you know, you, you swab their lung or their throats, take blood cultures, and those things take days to grow out. And then when they grow out, they'll say, yep, this person has this bug and this particular antibiotic or antifungal works against it, right? So, so meanwhile, these things in those three days where you're on this broad spectrum, not getting exactly what you should be getting for that particular disease that's overtaken your immune system, you can die, all right? Well, because the genome, which used to be, used to cost a million dollars to screen and identify, you can now get a whole human genome, your, all of your DNA, for 150 bucks. You can get all of your DNA, 150 bucks. Used to be a million bucks 20 years ago. So, What's Doc talking about? Well, it turns out you can send that swab off down the street to a company that will now match up the RNA that's existing on that swab with known bacteria, known fungus, literally using computing power within minutes determine what the bug is. And so instead of you waiting for three days, in which case, you know, half of you are going to die, you within hours of feeling crappy going through the ER door and you've got cancer, so you're weak already, boom, you know which drug, you know what to do, what to fight it, how to fight it within hours, if not minutes. That's incredible. 
That's game-changing technology. And I literally just didn't, I didn't even know that existed 48 hours ago. I mean, I, you know, I could imagine it in my brain, someone doing it, but lo and behold, it's practically being applied. Um, and there's a company in the Northwest uh, that does that and a university out there that has some of the, the IP on that. But these are the kind of things that are happening left and right, you know, um, in the land of leukemia, there are certain certain genetic profiles, even in, in lung cancers now, where drugs have been made targeted specifically to that genetic profile of that person. And so give that drug to somebody else with, with the same disease, but not that genetic profile, the drug doesn't work. Give it to someone with that drug, that genetic profile, they're cured. Five years later, they're cured. This is happening in colon cancers, rectal cancers, lung cancers, head and neck cancers. Like this stuff is right here, right now, curing diseases that killed people 10 years ago. And so that's what I'm super excited about. There's lots of money waiting to, to buy these smaller businesses. And there's just the technology, you know, once it gets cheap to do the genetic stuff, now you can combine that with the power of computing. Uh, I'm, I'm just super excited. And it'll bring in algorithms into it so that you won't be having to trust uh, a tired doctor on call, what to give or what to do or mistakes. Won't, I mean, right, all that's going to be integrated. They'll know. They'll have your health records. Uh, those will travel with you in space and time. There's no, like, waiting to hear what the history is. It's just, I don't know, I'm, I'm so excited both for, I think, living longer and healthier but also being able to, uh, you know, keep my older friends around longer as well. That's kind of the fun of this. So. Right. And Doc, if I could add a rubber meets the road comment to, to what you're talking about, because I think you're spot on. You know, CMS, right, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the big government agency that that operates both of those big government healthcare programs, has has recently created a reimbursement code, so a code that doctors can use for what's called remote patient monitoring mm. or RPM codes. And those codes started a f two, three years ago, but they've evolved um, tremendously in the last three years. So, so what, what is the real point of that? Well, the real point of that is doctors and other providers are now going to actually be able to get paid to adopt some of this stuff we're talking about. Right. Right. right? And so that, that's a big incentive for getting this technology out into the world, into the marketplace, into homes, into hospitals, into skilled nursing facilities. Um, you know, it's great to have the technology, but if large payers, you know, aren't going to support it financially, it's tough to get traction. But CMS has got it out there already. And I think you're just going to see more and more of these types of reimbursement mechanisms that are getting, you know, getting approved by big government payers. Yep, love it. That's very cool. So I'm hearing, you know, I heard uh, telehealth and wider digital health. And then I heard a huge opportunity for big pharma to buy a lot of, you know, potentially a whole bunch of little like biotech type companies developing all kinds of new technology using what with with what the human the ability to to um, to track the human genome at the center of it, Doc? Did I get that right? Yeah, just being being able to um, to know, you know, if I uh, if I put uh, your DNA into uh, a dish along with the bug that is attacking you, and then I I sequence that, I'll be able to tell what bug it is quicker than having to grow it out, and then I can match that up to a library of known pathogens. But do it in seconds, you know. Um, and, yeah, and that's just that's right there. And everything. I mean, it's. I don't. Are you a twenty three and Me guy, Dan? Did yeah. you ever? Yeah, we we did. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's very cool stuff. And you know, you look at it and you see, okay, you might have a, you know, from a parent a single mutation that might lead to a certain phenotype. And you know, we're discovering things like, okay, well, if you have that. And you eat, and I'm making this up, but let's say eat a certain food that's high in one of those mixed, missed enzymes or in that pathway, you bypass it with potentially drugs, potentially foods, 
potentially kinds of exercises, the speed, the pace, the length, things like exercise, all change your genetics. And it's just so <laughs> cool because, you know, no one would have thought really until thalidomide uh, that it was even possible for one generation to affect two or three generations later um, by altering epigenetics. We now know that you can affect epigenetics just by going and walking five days a week. And that turns off and turns on genes that help you process everything from your cholesterols to other fats to even chemicals that relate to your mood and your your, sort of your overall gestalt of, of life's existence. Super exciting because it's based off of science, based off of numbers, and you can now connect that up by having both a broad, cheap genetic profiles for folks. And then, you know, I, I don't know how much you participate in 23andMe, but you can also tell them stories and stuff about, um, you know, you can start tracking things like your food and your activity and like it's coming. It's coming where it'll be Star Trek. It'll be a little tricorder and they'll scan you. You'll scan yourself with your iPhone or your Samsung and it'll say, you know what? Don't walk very fast today. Make sure you're in bed by 945 because the sun sets at 930. And oh, by the way, tomorrow you only need one cup of green tea. Don't drink coffee. All right. I mean, and it'll be all based on science and we'll feel better, truly feel better. That's exciting. Yeah, Dan, the one word I'm thinking about, you know, after listening to Doc talk about all this cool stuff is immunology, right? Basically using your own body's immune system to create medicines that target disease specific to you, right? So-called precision medicine or personalized medicine. Uh, and, you know, it makes me think about, and, and some of your some of your listeners probably saw this this headline about a month ago. There was a small study looking at colorectal cancer, uh, where they used a, 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 a targeted therapy like this, and it was a small study, eighteen participants, but but all eighteen participants went into remission. I mean, uh, uh, that's just amazing. You, you never have a hundred percent, you know, you know, results like that. It's, I mean, that's just jaw dropping. And, and that's right where we are today. This stuff is happening. And if I can mention a, a, a book that if your readers are into this and want to dive into it a little more, very easy to read. It's called Hacking Darwin by Jamie Metzl. Fantastic story, book about uh, all the stuff that's happening out there right now and, and, and really lays out, you know, over the next 10 years and 10 years, not, not, a, not a huge period of time, right? All the advances that we really believe are going to take place over the next decade are going to be absolutely phenomenal. Very cool. I feel like um, we've sort of been focused on nitty gritty up and coming technologies and things. But what about when I think healthcare, I think of a lot of different areas, you know, like what about just very broadly, like, you know, healthcare, real estate plays and, you know, managed care services. Is that at all attractive to either one of you right now? Oh, I mean, Tom. Yeah, if I, Tom if can I, jump in on this. He's yeah. he's all over this stuff. I, I'm amazed each time yeah, I, I hear gonna, him talk was, about it. <laughs> I was going to say, thanks, Zach. Let me let me jump in on that. Yeah. So all of that stuff, right? The the infrastructure of the healthcare system, right? Everything from you know doctors' offices and medical office buildings and hospitals to insurance companies and um, you know payment platforms and networks of doctors and uh, just, I mean everything out there again i think i think investors along the way are either spooked by not understanding how those things interact and work um or or are spooked by it because it's it's or, or just un, plain, plainly uninteresting right because it's it's healthcare and boring and i don't want to think about that right now i'd rather think about you know gadgets and whiz bang kind of things but you know one of the examples i use that you know and, and i like to get I, I i try to get an aha moment reaction from from folks when i talk about you know health insurance right not not exactly a a, a sexy topic but from an investment perspective i mean i mean think about what health insurance is right it's it's effectively paying for health care for people over time and 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 su supporting the increases in those payments over time 
uh, and trying to wrap in as many efficiencies as possible. So, you know, the example I use is, you know, if you look at the, the a 50 year period uh, in the United States, look at, you know, health expenditures, healthcare has grown over the last 50 years, about 10% per year, which I find just amazing in and of itself, right? How can an industry drive 10% increases every year for 50 years, right? Is unsustainable. Well, it just keeps sustaining itself. Uh, would it be great if you could invest in that, right? I mean, there, there, there's there's not much more of a sure thing in this country than health care costs going up. And investing in a health insurance company essentially invests in that annuity. Uh, because if you're a health insurance company and you're expecting your costs next year to go up 7 or 8%, well, then you've got to raise your premiums by 8 or 9%, right? So, so these, these companies have this built-in price increaser that happens each and every year for years and years and years. Uh, you know, think about, you know, and I'm sure you have listeners that own small businesses. I mean, I, I ask the question when I make talks, about, I have talks about this, you know, who's a small business owner? Wouldn't it be great if you could raise your price every year for 10 years and your customers would have to pay it? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic little understanding that most people have n- no understanding of uh, as it relates to health insurance companies. And, and over the last 20, 30 years, they've been phenomenal investments. And as long as there's not going to be any change in the way U.S. healthcare is financed, which I don't see anytime soon, this mechanism is just going to continue to exist. And investors will be able to take, take advantage of this over the long term. So, you know, understanding that that the, the nuts and bolts and the infrastructure and all the pieces, you know, it is very important for investing. But but Dan, here's the thing. It's also important for just managing your health care and your number one asset. You know, if you better understand, for example, where the medical dollar goes, as I call it, you know, how much is spent on hospitals, how much is spent on doctors, how much is really spent on prescription drugs, you have much better context in order to be a better consumer yourself. Right. And we're all customers. Right. There's a very uh, this this, of course, reminds me of Peter Lynch, who always said, you know, if you want to buy your own stocks, great, Mm -hmm. you know, go shopping, go to the grocery store. What do you buy? Why do you buy it? What else? What is everyone else buying? And there's there's a lot of that um, in what you guys are saying. Yeah, I've I've used that exact I've used that exact Peter Lynch example a number of times. That's spot on. Okay, so we're. um, you know, up to this point, we're sort of, uh, you know, teaching the listener how to fish. And I know, you know, you've got this new research product, Prosperity Investor. You've made some some new stock picks in there. And I know I understand that they're for paying subscribers. So if you don't want to indulge me, I get it. But I have to ask if there's one or two that you wouldn't mind sort of, you know, letting, letting our listeners in on. Oh, boy. I mean, I... You know, Dan, I don't like to do that because the paid, the paid subs. Um, but I can tell you know I can, I can give you an example. Um, but but people don't do you know don't go out and do this. But uh, if my sister was calling me up and say, "Hey, I'm too cheap to pay for your letter, and I don't want you to give it to me for free," what could I do to play? Let's say in the biotech space, and and you have to understand in our letter we're doing two different things. Where well, really three things. One of the legs of the stool is this group of stocks that we really, you know, we're calling them seven of them buy and hold forever. And then we're doing three stocks that we think have the potential for hundreds, if not thousand percent gains. And you don't want to put your rent money in just the three. You'd want to have it balanced across this. But one of the things that um, when we meet uh, and talk about it, I'm going to pitch this as an idea to the group the XBI ETF, and this is the biotech ETF. You know, it's down, I th- you know, it's where it was like five years ago. And I'm telling you, what's happened in biotech is five years, in the past five years, there's just no way this thing is worth the same as it was five years ago. And the, and the companies in there are all companies that I look at and are watching and contemplating getting involved with. So, you know, that's something... If you were interested in this, I would say, you know, subscribe to our letter. Um, but something that, you know, 
is down and looks interesting to me is that uh, the XBI ETF. And again, I feel bad, you know, someone goes and says, oh, you told me to buy ETF XBI. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm just saying, go look at it because it's something I would, you know, tell my my sister, like, look at the stocks in there. That's an, that's These are the kinds of stocks where all of the stuff we're talking about is happening. And then do your own research, read about it, learn about it, go meet people at the company, um, go get your MD degree, get your master's in healthcare from Johns Hopkins. Oh, wait, we've got two guys on the Wait, all of us. <laughs> I already now. did okay. that. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. So, the, but that's, it's a good observation though. You, you know, basically this thing has gone sideways. XBI has gone sideways for five years. You know, it's 2017 prices with 2022 values and levels of innovation and technology. technology. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Sounded like Tom was going to chime in there. I, I, I was, and and kind of in the same vein as as Doc, what Doc mentioned, um, you know, p- part of this letter is looking at, you know, the 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 boring tried and true infrastructure parts of healthcare. It, it's looking at the the new innovative, uh, you know, genetic engineering kind of stuff. But you know, a, a, another bucket of of where we're looking here is, is a sector or, or a subsector of healthcare that I call kind of emerging slash controversial therapies, right? Things like psychedelics uh, to treat drug resistant depression uh, and and cannabis um, to treat uh, all, all kinds of things, as well as being a, a recreational substance. And so there's a, a an ETF, there's one ETF in the cannabis space that I think is the only one you should own. It's uh, the ticker is MSOS. It's Advisor Shares Pure US Cannabis ETF. And it it's a it's a it's a an ETF that invests in, in all the US based cannabis companies. Um, and quite frankly, they're they're the ones you want to own. Um, and with this one ticker you can you can buy all of them at once. Uh, and just like the biotech ETF that Doc mentioned, cannabis uh, stocks have been uh, absolutely pummeled in the last 12 months. Uh, so it is at it, you know it is near you know 52 week lows as, as well. Okay, great. So yeah, we got two two good ideas. I understand they're not um, ideas that you're recommending in the Prosperity Investor Research product, but they are the kind of things that that you're looking at. And it sounds like you both agree there. They make really good lists of, of stuff for further research. So that's, a, that's a very valuable and it's a great way to use ETFs too. I'll do that sometimes. Just tell people to look at the stocks inside an ETF to get an idea. So that's good, you know, and I appreciate you're not wanting to give away the, <laughs> the paid subscriber picks, you know, very cool. Okay, so we've talked about technology, some pretty nitty gritty cool stuff that I, you know, it sounds like Doc said, it sounds like Star Trek. And the more, you know, um, infrastructure related uh, plays that Tom was talking about, I can't believe that's it. Are we missing one that's really important? I mean, Dan, it sounds like you you think you've got one on us. It, you have one you want to share, or is there something? No, 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 no. I, I, I'm, well, I, I, I am cheating a little bit. Like I'm looking at, <laughs> I'm looking at your at your portfolio in Prosperity Investor, and I'm just there's a lot of different stuff in there. I mean, you just come right. at this thing from so many angles. You know, it's like cannabis and and you know, big pharma, medical devices, like traditional medical devices. Um, we haven't right, talked right. about that any, you know, is there, am I going to hook a Star Trek device up to my body real soon? Am I going to become one of the Borg? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if we were on camera, you would see that I'm sitting here, I've got an aura ring on, I've got a Fitbit and I'm wearing a whoop. I've got my iPhone watch. Um, and at bedtime I use an iPhone and a Samsung and I'm doing sleep monitoring the other thing is I, I have a, um, it's made by a company, I'm not going to reveal the name, but um, it's literally a home sleep apnea tester. And it's a, it's a large watch you put on your wrist. It's a little funky. It's a, a one-time use. You put your, one of your fingers in this thing and you go to sleep. But it's been approved by the FDA as a device. And it is as good as, if not better, then going and getting hooked up, you know, with, I don't know if anyone's had a sleep study. I'm, I'm imagining a lot of our listeners have, um, you know, these things taped 
glued onto your your scalp, underneath your hair. You're sleeping. If you're sleeping at a sleep lab, you're doing it without your normal uh, pillows, without your normal blankets, without your normal noises. Um, and, you know, this is a super accurate because you just do it at the comfort of your home. And then it tells you what to do. And you can do this and use it to modify settings on your CPAP machine if you have one of those. This stuff is happening right now. And we know that most people won't even think about, say, doing sleep studies till they're, they're sleeping in a separate bed. Their spouse is kicking out. They're snoring all night. They're tired all day long. They're waking up with bad headaches. Um, this is something you could do at age 55 and 60 and get a, a baseline. And, you know, it's only a few hundred dollars. And there are a couple of physicians now around the U.S. that will do it from a distance. Um, our guy down in Scottsdale, um, Dr. Dedia, I mean, he'll do this, you know, sort of concierge medicine from a distance and send you this thing in the mail and help you get labs and all this. This is happening, man. It's right now in the comfort of your home. Um, you know, you're going it, to, it's your, you're fine. You know, most people take care if they have a nice car, they take care of it and take it in and tune it up. This technology is allowing us to do that right in the comfort of your home. Um, I, I just give you another example. The other day, um, my whoop told me that, Hey, listen, I was behind in my sleep the last couple nights. You really ought to get to bed, not at 1115, but it was telling me like 928. And I was going like, what are you talking about? But I said, you know what? Let me try it. The other apps on my phone don't know that this told me that I'm going to bed at 928. So I turn those on when I turn them on. And both of those sleep apps, when I got up the next morning, told me I had perfect 100 scores. And I felt like a million bucks. And this is from some silly watch telling me when to go to bed. And obviously, I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want to do. I could stay up. I could have desserts. Um, another example of technology, I, I was out dining with some uh, uh, physicians. Um, and he, because of uh, some stuff going on with his, in his life, he's got a glucose monitor. Um, he's got some steroids on board for a, a problem he's facing. And this thing tells him, literally, he can look on the app on his phone, find out his blood sugar level and determine after eating the meal that he's eaten whether or not he can have dessert and how good is you know his exercise program doing relative to his blood sugars and i mean that's happening right now it exists it's working it's here dan it's not just a star trek it's here very cool so let's talk specifically before we go um about the Prosperity Investor product. Um, you can find out about it by going to retirementwarning2022.com, retirementwarning2022.com. Well, I have to ask, what the heck is the warning? Are you, are you warning people that if they don't invest in healthcare, they're missing out on something? Or is there something more sinister that you're warning them about? I, I mean, I think, I think you're throwing away your life if you don't pay attention to the health side of it, which we'll be sharing and talking about. It's something that I've done in a, a smaller way in Retirement Millionaire. Um, and so that's kind of an added plus and bonus. And, and then you, you've got this team. There's no way you can match uh, a team like this. Um, you know, we're hitting from Tom, who can look at it, um, everything from companies that are managing Medicare and Medicaid to picks and shovels to you alluded to it already uh, devices. I mean, all this stuff, Tom has been looking at this, eating, sleeping it for 40 years. And then Engel comes from the science side of it. I mean, I go, I feel like he's the best, uh, you know, duck hunting dog there is. It's like, you know, you go out and you say, go get it. And John comes back with like four ducks and the ducks have been filleted and they've been cooked in the oven perfectly with lemon or cherry or whatever it is. You're just like, wow. He dives down into this stuff. You've seen him on some of the other pubs that he's been a part of. Um, he knows the science. And then I'd like to imagine that I have a brain to follow this stuff as well. Um, 
and I love the science. And so it's fascinating. And I, the warning is don't miss out. You know, it's, it's like, don't, I don't know, Tom, do you have any thoughts on, on, on the warning idea? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that it's to me, the, the warning is look, you, you need to focus on healthcare. Uh, if you're going to be an investor, if you plan on living a healthy life, if you plan on, uh, you know, uh, supporting and being with your family, I mean, that's always been true, right? But but I think it's it, it's even more true right now, given where we are with the confluence of technology, with what we know from a from a physiological and a biological perspective. Uh, the pandemic really, you know. <laughs> I hate to give it credit for something, but it you know it really accelerated and catalyzed uh, our our need to do more, right? To to manage our our number one asset, our healthcare, uh, and at the same time, along the way, become better consumers and become better investors, right? There's this whole group of stocks out there that that people oftentimes just ignore, and they're giving up all kinds of long term, relatively low risk return opportunities okay. um especially in the in you know what i call the healthcare infrastructure type right. place got it so i think right now it's very important to be focused on that again what i we hope you do it through prosperity investor but if not you know do it somewhere else you know get get your healthcare more front and center all right sounds good folks folks don't listen to tom do it right here a prosperity <laughs> I was gonna investor. Say. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, so if you go to www.retirementwarning2022.com, that's the kind of warning we're talking about. Don't miss out on a great opportunity to take care of yourself, you know, physically and financially. All right. Um, I do have my final question. I don't often get to ask it of two guests, usually, usually Uh just one. Uh Uh If you've been on the show before, you might remember it. Um, It's the same for every guest, no matter what the topic and hot dogs and Coca-Cola is my no, answer. Doc, I'll start with you. The final question <laughs> is always the same. If you could leave our listeners with one thought today, what would it be? After finishing listening to Tom's answer, and you're closed, Dan, close up your computer, put on a watch, look at the watch, and go out for a 30-minute walk at what any and ever pace you can do. That is awesome. That is one of the best, most actionable answers ever given in the history of the show. Woo! Yeah. I love it. And it's it's real, man. Yeah. I mean, that's like life-changing, truly. All right. How about you, Tom? One thought to leave our listener with. So you're not going to believe this, but my answer is almost exactly the same as Doc's. And I swear <laughs> to God, we're not texting. We're oh. not looking at each other. We're not doing anything. <laughs> I was go- I was going to say not right now. I was going to say at some point, get outside, look at the trees, take some breaths, walk around, get your Tom, heart how rate does, up. How does it feel? Just a little bit. Tom, how does it feel to have the second best answer ever given on the show? <laughs> well, I'm married 25 years this yeah. week, so uh, I've been getting yeah. used to it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, two, two very good answers. Hey, Dan. Yeah. What's the number one advice you'd give? What one thing would you leave with people? Wow. Um, no one ever turns the question back on me ever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I would probably, I'm not a health guy, so, you know, don't take health advice from me. Um, but if I, if somebody did ask me about you know, the area of health, um, I would just say move, you know, yeah, uh, move, yeah. move more than you think you need to move every day. Don't be too sedentary um, and, and leave it at that probably. Great. Love it. All right. Well, really great having the two of you on here. We'll have to get John Engel on the show sometime and talk with him too, um, because he's a big part of what you're doing with Prosperity Investor. And, um, you know, just, I just want to say thank you both for being here and we will definitely be having you both back on real soon. Good. Great. Thanks, Dan. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. So I guess that's bye-bye for now and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Always fun to talk with my old friend Doc um, and with Tom Carroll as well. Longtime listeners will recognize both of them. And of course, having them together, I think is great. And I can't imagine like you put those two together and then you get John Engel in there. Um, I'm really looking forward. Of course, I work for Stansberry, so I've gotten to take a look at the Prosperity Investor and I've read a couple of the reports and seen some of the work and it's, you know, it's just exactly what you'd expect it to be. Um, it's really incredible. And the fact that they're focusing on, you know, physical and financial health, like your health plus, you know, what, what you would invest in if you really were knowledgeable about your health, what you'd invest in to take advantage of your knowledge. It's pretty cool. I think that adds something that you probably don't get elsewhere. And if you want to learn more about it, once again, you can go to retirementwarning2022.com and check it out. Okay, that was great. Now let's take a look at the mailbag. Let's do it right now. A new financial crisis has developed recently in America, says stock market expert Matt McCall. And the trail of destruction it could leave behind will look nothing like what you might expect. In fact, McCall warns nearly 40% of the elite publicly traded companies, brands you've known and used your whole life, could go bankrupt because of a strange market event he calls the flippening, wiping out thousands of investors' fortunes. McCall has written a brand new report explaining exactly what the flippening is how billionaires are already profiting from this big event, and what you should be doing to prepare as well. To get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to mattflipreport.com. Again, that's mattflipreport.com for a free copy of our report. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send comments, questions, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows and respond to as many as possible. You can also call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Lots of stuff about gold this week. We'll just dive right in with Charles M. Charles M. has a real bone to pick. Charles says, I know you say never sell gold, but have you ever tried? Yeah, I, I, I've i said many times, Charles, that I did sell gold once and I regretted it. Charles continues, when dealing in collectibles like gold, your average investor has to go through some kind of dealer. Therefore, your average investor gets ripped off with at least a 20% up sale when buying. I'm going to stop you right there and I'm not going to answer the rest of the question because it's all based on that, which is wrong. You should never be paying a 20% premium. You know, I realize coins were, you know, there was a shortage or whatever, but you should ask around. And if American Eagles are 20% premium, then ask about Maple Leafs or something else, or don't buy them right then. You know, there are plenty of gold coins in the world and you should never pay 20% when you buy them. So that is wrong. And, you know, I've never paid more than about five or six percent um, and I'm never going to sell them. So I almost don't care. And and all the rest of what you said in your question kind of was based on that. So um, saying that uh, as you, you finished your email saying as an investment is a good way to get ripped off because there is no fair exchange for the average investor. That's simply false. It's just not true. And you can buy it through like one and, you know, pay hard, just about nothing, pay very little. Or you can own a, you know, the like the Sprott Physical Trust, ticker symbol PHYS, which I've recommended in my newsletter as a good way of, to own gold. And it's real physical gold in the Canadian Royal Mint. And maybe some other mints now. I, I haven't checked on that lately. Um, but I know it is at least in the Royal Canadian Mint. Great way to, to buy it that, it, you know, you can b basically get it almost for free because you buy it through your brokerage account and Commissions are zero these days. So um, look around, Charles. You're, you're getting, you are getting ripped off if you're paying 20%, but it's not necessary to do that. Next is Wade S. And Wade S. says, 
how do you view share buybacks versus dividends as a benefit to the shareholder? When I see a company that has a lot of free cash flow but never pays a dividend, it is a bit of a turnoff. Take Meta, for example, Meta Platforms, formerly known as Facebook. Wade continues, he says, if I accept no dividends, then I have to accept the notion that I have to sell a portion of the asset to ever get income from the asset. To me, if a company's return on CapEx is going down, then it is not in a growth phase and the shareholder should expect some income. I guess I could simulate a dividend by selling appreciated shares, but that doesn't work if share prices are down. Thanks for your insights, Wade S. Well, you're not wrong about all of that if you if they pay no dividend. Buffett has recommended, Warren Buffett has recommended doing exactly that with Berkshire stock. He says, you know, you want a dividend, sell 4% of your stock a year or something. But of course, then you don't have the stock. And the reason he doesn't pay one and the reason other companies don't pay them is like in the case of Meta, they earn high returns on capital. You do want them to retain as much cash as possible and reinvest it. Now, that has been true historically of Meta. I'm not saying it is necessarily true going forward. So, you, But that's the analysis you need to do. You need to say, well, if they're earning, you know, 50, 60 percent on capital because it's this software based business um, or some some high amount, 30, 40, 50, whatever, then I want them to retain as much as possible and invest as much as possible. Usually businesses that do earn that much and get that big can't reinvest at all. So then you're right. You kind of do want them to they'll probably just buy back stock with it. And, and you asked, uh, I'm sorry, you did ask about buybacks versus dividends as a benefit to the shareholder. So I like dividends better because you get that absolute amount of cash. Uh, you, you know, it's double taxed because it's taxed at the corporate level and then it's taxed when you get it, which is grotesque in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's criminal. It's grotesque. But it is what it is. And um, where the buybacks, of course, they can benefit you if they're done very well, but they're mostly done poorly. Um, we've looked at, I've been, we've been looking at buybacks every single month for 20 years. And I finally had to change the language that I use to, to in extreme value when I deal with buybacks. And I have a little section for things like free cash flow and margins and buybacks. And the little there's a little blurb of text that's identical um, every month just to describe why we're looking at it for a new reader if they don't know. And and the buyback text had to change from buybacks are really great or whatever I used to say to most buybacks stink. I mean, that's not exactly what it says, but that's what it means. Most buybacks just stink. Most companies are terrible at it. They buy back more shares when they have more cash, which is usually at the top of the cycle when the stock is really expensive. And then when there's a recession and the stock falls, ooh, then everybody's scared and they won't buy it back. So, yeah, buybacks stink. I'd rather have dividends. Buybacks have been more popular because interest rates have been so low and you could borrow and borrow and borrow. And it was a lot cheaper to borrow and buy back the stock than it was to pay a dividend. Uh, a, you know, a dividend that was attractive enough to mean anything. Next is Eric A. And Eric A says, hi, Dan, really enjoy your show. But I've heard you mention several times now that some money growth is needed to support a growing economy. I think this is false. Although it is true that you will likely need to divide the existing money units into smaller pieces over time. And then he says a whole bunch of stuff that I d can't read. Um Anyways, he says, thanks again for all the great information you put out there on the show. I learned a lot from Eric A. Eric, the, there was plenty of gold pulled out of the ground between 1815 and 1913, and it was a century of deflation. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a money expert. I just kind of noticed that. And, and, I, and what George Gilder said to me rang true, you know, for that reason alone. So, you know, if it's not true, hey, Get me a money expert to explain how all this is supposed to work. And and no, Murray Rothbard is not one. As much as I admire the man and love his ideas, not a money expert. Um, although he had a lot of good things to say about banking. We could quibble about that. We could debate about whether Rothbard is the, is the authority on that. Maybe we'll do that another time, Eric. Thanks for the question. And finally this week is Dan F. Yeah, Dan F. Same Same last initial as me. And Dan F. says, 
Hi, Dan. In June of 2020, the U.S. inflation rate was 0.6%. Then, since then, it's gone up 15x, and we've had a war breakout that severely impacted the global economy, yet gold sits at the same price it was back then. In fact, the war broke out this year, and inflation really took off, but gold is down about 5% on the year. If gold is still relevant, how can it sit there doing nothing with these two key factors that have been present in the extreme? Since the average age of people who hold gold is 55, could it be that there aren't enough younger investors who care about gold to keep the historical thesis for it going. I hold plenty of gold. I'm 65. But I'm really starting to wonder if I'm living in a time gone by regarding this. I would appreciate your thoughts on it, Dan F. Um, so you can't cherry pick a moment in time and say, you know, it didn't work. I, somebody did this on Twitter recently. I, it's just stupid. It's just not how you do things. But I, I worry a lot less about this than everyone else. Maybe I'm, del maybe I'm the delusional one. Everybody keeps telling me I'm delusional about this even though gold has absolutely destroyed everything else this year. It has beat bonds, stocks, Bitcoin, whatever else, except for a few commodities that soared. And now they're curling over. So, And gold is off 5%. You're complaining this year? I mean, how anybody could do this, I have no idea. Gold, as much as anything, has done extremely well as a store of value. And, you know... The dollar, technically speaking, is down 9%. So gold's ahead real 4.4%. So I don't, I, I, I don't know what the problem is. I mean, people are liquidating. They're scared. It's the end of the biggest bubble in history. They sell everything. I've said this many, many times. Yes, gold will sell off because you can't sell anything in this world, stocks, bonds, you know, corn chips, without buying dollars. Dollar is 80% or I heard last number I heard was high 70s, 78, 79% of global transaction values and 60% of global foreign exchange reserves. So that means that when people sell en masse, like they've sold trillions of securities and gold and everything else, um, just to get cash, cash means dollars. So everything falls in price, including gold. I've said this many, many times, but the fact that gold has destroyed tech stocks really, I think, especially pisses off the tech stock people because they're, you know, they're saying, oh, well, see, gold's terrible. It didn't work. And to cherry pick June of 2020 and say, oh, the setup was perfect. No, you don't know that. You don't, you know, we, we do, people pretend to be able to read markets and why something went up and why it down, but nobody really can, <laughs> you know, they're saying this happened. Therefore, it means such and you know this this particular asset is going up or down in price, and that means this. Uh, okay, are you telling me you're right a hundred percent of the time when you say this? Because most people aren't. Most people aren't even right half the time when they say it, even if they're billionaire successful investors. What the billionaire successful investors, people like Stanley Druckenmiller and George Soros and all the rest, um, you know, those trader types, not the Warren Buffett types. What they don't tell you is like, and Paul Tudor Jones has talked about this. He's another one. Yeah, they caught the bottom or the top or whatever, but you know, it was after 15 tries of getting it wrong, right? That's, that's what they do best. They're out as soon as they're wrong and they keep trying and trying and trying. So do they know how, what the market means? Do they know what it means? You know, and they abandon the thesis when, when it just doesn't work. So do they know what it means or do they just have an idea? They're right often enough, but more than that, they get out when they're wrong, right? So you can tell me you know that because inflation was 0.6% in June 2020 and the price went sideways since then, you know, the inflation is up 15x or whatever, that it doesn't work anymore, but I don't know that. And I don't know anyone who really does, frankly. So that, I don't know. There, I, it is a complicated subject. You think I'm not disappointed that gold hasn't gone up? Well, of course, but it's gone up in real terms, as I just said a moment ago. And that's all you need. <laughs> that's what you need. Anyway, it's, there, it's a great question, actually. It, it's annoying because, you know, I have, I have to deal with the fact that this thing I keep recommending is not behaving the way everybody else thinks it should. But I don't think it should behave that way. It's a 50 bagger since gold and the dollar parted ways in August 15th, 1971. 
it has beaten stocks in the 21st century. I'm, I'm good with that much. I could talk more about this, but this answer is already way too long. So good stuff, Dan F. You know, if anybody else wants to rehash this, write in. I'll, I'll talk about it some more. It's a good topic. Well, that's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. And do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.